Let's look at our scripture for this morning. We're looking in 1 Peter again, continuing on in the book of 1 Peter. Looking today at verses 10 through 13 of chapter 1. Peter writes, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicated when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Teach us from your word. Shape us more and more into the image of your beloved son that we might be sanctified by your grace. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, last week on Easter, we saw the living hope that we have in Christ's resurrection. And I hope that you remember it, because uh, unfortunately we had a glitch in the recording last week. And while you can see me just fine, there's no audio there. So uh, we won't be uploading that sermon anytime soon unless I decide to dub over it or something like that in the future. But let me give you a quick reminder, just in case you forgot uh, where we were in the book of 1 Peter and, and how we got there. And this reminder you know, comes from the text because there in verse 10 as we're starting out today, it says concerning this salvation. What salvation? What salvation? Let, let's remind ourselves of where we were. Well, we saw last week that our hope is rooted in the fact that God has shown us great mercy. He has shown us great mercy and he has given us new birth by uniting us together to Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Okay, so we, we see this great salvation that is here. This is our hope in life and our hope in death, that Jesus is our substitute. And we experience this hope here and now today through trials and tribulations. And that is our faith being tested, our faith being purified. This faith that God is building in us will be proven pure. It will be proven perfect when we see him on that final day, on that last day, when he welcomes us into his father's kingdom and says, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into your kingdom. So Peter defines this faith that we see in verse 8. Go back up to verse 8. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Is that what your faith looks like? That was what we looked at last week. Do, do you love Jesus? Do you trust him? Are you rejoicing in spirit of what things, contrary to what things might look like in your life? Peter goes on in verse 9 to, to say that if God has birthed this kind of hope in us, and we have this kind of faith, then we will obtain the outcome of that faith. And what is the outcome of the faith? In verse 9 it says, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is our salvation. And notice how Peter refers to the, the process of our salvation. It, it is something that we have experienced in the past through the work of God in the new birth, that we are experiencing here and now through the testing of our faith, and that we will experience on the final day as the salvation of our souls. It is a full picture. Salvation is something to be fully celebrated. It's not just avoidance of a terrible future punishment, but it's something that has roots in eternity past, which sustains us in the midst of our exile here and now, and is an inheritance in the glorious heavenly kingdom for all eternity. Amen? That, that's our salvation. And it is to be rejoiced in. And as we move into today's text, 
I want you to see that Peter is informing his readers, who are mostly Gentiles, we believe, about the history of their faith. He's giving them a, a glimpse into the, the history, the Jewish history of their faith, even the ancient history of the angels, so that they might fully appreciate their salvation. Stick with me here. What I think Peter is doing in this little aside in verses 10 to 12 is the same thing that we do when we tell our kids to eat their dinner because they're starving children in Africa. All right. How many of us have done that? You better eat, clean your plate because they're starving children in Africa. What are we doing when we say that? Why, why do we say things like that? Well, I think we want them to understand how fortunate they are, right? We want them to understand and appreciate what they have by letting them know how desirable what they have is to others who don't have it. And I think Peter here is giving these new believers some perspective on their salvation by doing just that. So they don't take it for granted. Look with me again at verses 10 through 12. It says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in which angels long to look. Here we can see Peter referring to these you know, readers that he's speaking to there in uh, Sicilia and Galatia that he's writing to. And it shouldn't be too hard for us to put ourselves in their shoes. There are a lot of similarities that we have with them. They were primarily Gentile. We are primarily Gentile. They were far from Jerusalem, far from the center of Christianity. We are far from Jerusalem. They are exiles in a strange land, and we are exiles in a strange land. They receive the good news of the free grace of God in Jesus, and we, too, have received that same free good news. They were born again into a living hope, and we have been born again into a living hope. However, however, Peter knew that they were tempted to take that grace for granted, as we all are. We too can get accustomed, far too accustomed to our, our Christian environment, that we forget how blessed we are in salvation. Amen. And so we're going to look at that more as we move forward today. But as we look back, we, we see that the prophets, the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, they spoke about Jesus. They spoke about this salvation. Hear it in, in the verse. Under the influence of the Spirit of Christ in them. I, want to, I think that is amazing. You hear it there in verse 11. It says, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicated. The Spirit of Christ is in them. This is amazing to me because it means that Christ, the, the Son of God in heaven, has been contemplating His suffering and His death for centuries and letting others in on that contemplation. Just think about that for a minute. As far back as the plan of salvation reaches in the mind of God, the eternal, pre-incarnate Jesus has been willing and ready to give himself for our sins. You were not loved for one bloody moment of sacrifice in history. You have been loved for endless ages in the eternal plan of the Father and the Son to save sinners who trust him. What a glorious thing our salvation is. That God has planned this from eternity. The prophets longed to be a part of this. They, they wanted to see this fulfilled in their day and they wrote these things down. Just one example is Isaiah chapter 53. This was written 700 years before Jesus ever showed up in a manger. 700 years before we see the beginning of the New Testament. He says this in Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse 2. It says, He had no form or majesty that we should look at Him, and no beauty that we should desire Him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before his shearers silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. Stricken for the test transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, though he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. How magnificent! This is written 700 years before Jesus shows up, and I can read it and imagine the passion story playing out. It, it was a glorious picture. And Isaiah died and never saw it. He looked into it. He longed to see Christ. And he never saw it with his eyes physically. He saw it with his spiritual eyes. He saw it with his heart. He hoped. In response to this, I'm sure that Isaiah and the other prophets would have asked, Who? Who is this servant, Lord? Who, who is it? When will these things happen? We see Daniel asking those things. But Peter reminds us that it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but us. They were serving us who have heard this good news proclaimed through them and through the preaching of the word down to this very day. Peter is simply repeating the message that Jesus told him in Matthew chapter 13, verses 16 and 17, where he says, Blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Or as the writer of Hebrews tells us at the end of the, the hall of faith, as he looks at all of the the, the righteous men and women down through the ages in chapter 11. He speaks of all the giants of the faith and how they endured trials by faith even though they never saw the thing that they were searching for. Here in verses 13 and 39 and 40 of Hebrews 11 it says, they, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us. That apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Wow. What a, what a glorious thing to imagine the, the history. As much history as has passed since before. Of people worshipping. The point is that for thousands of years, from the time of Abraham and Job down through Joseph and Moses to David and Solomon and the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, there were those who looked for and longed for the coming of the Messiah who would restore all things. They wrote down their hopes. They wrote down their promises that were given to them. And we have those in Holy Scripture. But today, the Holy Spirit speaks to us directly. The Holy Spirit speaks to us through the preaching of the Word, and He lets us know the full story. And we can participate in a salvation that generations before us had only hoped for. What a salvation we have. 
Peter even goes a step beyond those saints of old, though, and, and he enters into the very heavenly realms, and he says that our salvation is something that even the angels have longed to look into. And he doesn't say this because they can't look into it. Okay? He's not saying that they want to, but they can't touch it. It, it means that they want to, in a sense, because they are outsiders of the, the drama of sin and redemption that we are part of. They are sinless. They've never fallen. They love to watch the drama of sin and redemption play out. It's their favorite show. I imagine, I imagine them you know, watching with their popcorn, enjoying the, the next episode in the story of redemption play out. The angels long to look into this story. It's, it's the thing that's kept them on the edge of their seat for eternity. And they still are waiting for that final day when God says... It's time. They're still waiting. They're, they're with bated breath. They're holding their breath and looking into the story of salvation. I think Peter's point is this. If the angels get excited about their salvation, then how much more should we be excited about our own salvation? If angels love to look at the work of God in saving sinners like us, how much more should we, who are the very beneficiaries of that salvation, love to look into it and be thankful for it? So let's move into verse 13 with a, with a proper understanding, a proper appreciation of our salvation and the history behind it. Let's look into verse 13 and notice that it begins with a therefore. As we all know, when there's a therefore, we have to ask, what's the therefore therefore? I know that's really corny, but it's a helpful tool when you're doing Bible study. As we look, there's this therefore, and I think that Peter is guiding these believers into an appreciation of their salvation, as we just saw, and then on to the question of how this salvation should lead them to live. He's getting into the practical matters here. And first, I want you to notice that this call for action that Peter is issuing proceeds from God's action in salvation, not the other way around. Our call to action proceeds out of God's action in salvation. Nowhere in Scripture does it appear the other way around. Peter knew his great need for grace. We've talked about Peter and how he was stumbling and fumbling in his quest for salvation. He knew that he needed grace. He was sure to make it known that our salvation is not earned through our holy living. Rather, as we will see, holy living is the natural, therefore, of being born again into a living hope. Amen. Here, Peter is moving us to the application of these doctrinal truths. We can't have one without the other. We can't have one without the other. What we're talking about, we actually just talked about this week in our WhatsApp men's you know, discussion board there. Uh, we ask the question, what's more important in preaching or in the Christian life? Is it doctrine or is it application? And I believe that both must be present. The two have to be there. Now, Paul, in his writings, tends to separate those two a little bit more than Peter does. Paul, in his letters, usually features an intensive application section at the end of the book, after the doctrine has been laid out in a nice systematic fashion. He, he puts all the doctrine out on the table and says, now do this. <laughs> and he lays it out. But Peter is much more integrated. Peter is much more integrated in his idea of doctrine and application. I think it's possible for us to gather and to debate doctrines, but never live them. And I also think that it's possible to thoroughly apply a very shallow and incorrect faith. And both of those are warped understandings and warped practices. Praise God. Charles Spurgeon once said, When your mind is instructed concerning some grand truth, think doctrine, after you have sucked the honey and joy out of it, always say to yourself, but what are the bearings of this doctrine upon my life? How should it influence me? What would God have me do as the result of receiving a teaching such as this? That's how we balance the two. 
Again, it should be very, very clear that our faith and our obedience proceeds not from our personal experiences, but from the sound doctrine of the Word of God. That's where it comes from. That's where we get our bearings. Our personal experiences should proceed from our faith and obedience and not the other way around. So we see this, therefore, at the beginning of verse 13. And if we see it there as a transition from the information that has come before, and now we are into the instruction, that's, that's helpful. Or maybe it's the move from the informative or the indicative to the imperative. Well, we see that. We see that in the Greek as we read this. Uh, we see the, the main commands of Peter's words pop out to us in, in the Greek. Now, I'm just going to look at one of those commands today as we look at verse 13. And I'm going to save the others in, in future verses for the next couple of weeks. So today, we're going to look at hope. We're going to look at this hope that he speaks about in verse 13. And sometimes it's, it's hard to see with kind of all of the mix of verbs that we see in, in the English. But in the Greek, it's obvious what the main points are from Peter. He has a very regular structure, and he uses the imperative tense sparingly. So when he throws it in, it kind of pops out to us. And so let me read it for you, removing everything but the imperative tense. We clear it all out. It says this. Therefore, set your hope. Pretty clear. Pretty clear what the main point is. That's our command. That's our imperative. Set your hope. Or your Bible might say, fix your hope. So today's message is simple. Set your hope. Verse 13 says, set your hope. And here Peter is, is stating a direct command, almost like a, like a military commander giving an issue to his soldiers. Other translations say, fix your hope. And I, and I like that translation, uh, not because it's better, but just because it, it makes me think of something being broken. It assumes that our hope is broken and that it must be something that is fixed. And when I look around the world today, I see a whole lot of broken hope. A whole lot of broken hope. People's hope is broken. It's placed in the wrong things. It's shattered by disappointment. And Peter, in response, says, fix your hope. This is a command on the part of every Christian that calls for uh, an act of the will more than just an emotional feeling. He's not saying, oh, you need to have a, a, a feeling of hope in your heart. This is a choice. This is an action that he is commanding us to do. And, and, and he therefore calls us to remember our great salvation. That's why he says the therefore at the beginning. Concerning this great salvation, therefore, fix your hope. And hope is a great thing. Hope is a great thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we all know it. At the very end, it says, now these Three remain. Faith. What's the second one? Hope. What's the third? Love. Love. We hear a whole lot about faith. We hear sermons and books on faith. We hear a lot about love. But hope, I feel like it's left out so often. And, and I honestly wonder if it's left out, if it gets ignored, because we like this life far too much. We'll get there soon enough. We talked about this hope last week, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but it's, it's born in us through the new birth. It is a work of God in us, and it's future focus as we look to this inheritance that's assured for all believers. This is a command. Set your hope. Fix your hope. Direct your hope. And you'll notice that after the word hope comes the word fully. Set your hope fully. It means unreservedly. That could be translated completely. Could be translated perfectly. He says, once for all, set your hope without equivocation, not half-heartedly, not indecisively, but with finality. Set it. The picture here is a settled act. It's done. It's completed. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 6, Hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Is hope your anchor? Is it the thing that you cling to? Are you set and fixed in hope fully? Now follow this thought. 
working our way back through these, these opening verses. Peter says in verse 3 that we've been born again to a living hope. So hope should characterize our life. It's a living hope, a hope for an inheritance, he says in verse 4, which is imperishable. It's undefiled and won't fade away. It's reserved in heaven for us who are being protected by the power of God through a faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The message is that we are to live in the hope of our eternal inheritance. And this hope is certainly a great help to us, as we just saw in Hebrews. It's, it's the anchor of our souls. Hope is a great help to us. It helps us to cast off the distractions of this world. But hope isn't just for us. Hope isn't just for us. God is glorified when we hope in Him. Our hope is for God's glory. God is glorified when you believe in Him. God is glorified when you trust in Him for this future promise. I think that's what Peter is really after as he speaks about hope here. So let's go back to the verse. He says, as we set our hope fully, what is it that we hope for? Right? We weren't quite there yet. Was, set your hope fully on what? We've got a question mark there. I love this in verse 13. He says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now notice this. He says, set your hope fully on what? On God? No. On the re revelation of Jesus Christ? No. But what about on Jesus himself? No. It says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the whole picture. And this is the second coming. This is the second coming that we see here. In other words, your hope is to look forward, look ahead to Christ's second appearing when he comes to reward and glorify his people. The day when the whole act of redemption, the whole work of redemption will be completed. The full culmination of our salvation. That is the anchor point of our hope. The fullness of our salvation. Paul in Romans chapter 8 calls it, the redemption of our bodies. He even says that all creation longs for this. Not just us, but even the trees and the rivers around us long for the redemption of the sons of God. John chapter, or 1 John chapter 3 verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Paul refers to this so beautifully in the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2. It says, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. But it doesn't stop there. In verse 13, he says, we are looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our hope. Our salvation doesn't just end with us accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior, and it's done there. And then we, oh, okay, I'll get heaven when I die, I guess. No, we are longing for it. The way that the prophets were longing for the coming of Christ in the Old Testament, we are still longing for the coming of Christ, for the culmination of all history, for the end of it all. Salvation phase one has appeared. Salvation phase two, in an ultimate sense, we still look for it. And so the responsibility, the first responsibility that we have as those who have received a great gift of salvation is to look ahead, to look ahead for the coming of Christ. But notice as well, he doesn't say that we should set our hopes or fix our hopes on an event. And what an event it will be, right? It's, it's going to be an amazing event. You hear people focus on that all the time. Wow, imagine what it's going to be like. The, the lights and the skies opening and the trumpets and the judgments and all those things. But he doesn't say set your hopes on an event. In this passage, he doesn't even say set your hope on Christ. He, he doesn't say set your hope on the glorious reward that you will receive. He doesn't say set your hope on your perfection. Just imagine, you're going to be made perfect. He doesn't say set your hope on heaven. And it's going to be fabulous. Instead, he says, set your hope fully on the grace. Did you get that? The grace that will be brought to you. 
I want you to know something. When you came to faith initially in Jesus Christ, it was all of grace. It was all of grace. And what's more, on the day that Jesus comes and glorifies you and gives you heaven and perfection and eternal life in His presence, it will be then as it was on the first day. All of grace. That's Peter's point. Do, do you imagine for a moment that God owes us our final glory because of something that we've done in our Christian life? Do you for a moment think that Christ will come and give to us what we've rightly earned by our spirituality? Are you under the illusion that your final glory and your final inheritance is yours by right, by earning, by worthiness? Don't be mistaken. Don't be mistaken. When you first came to receive the salvation of your soul, you didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You had no right to it. You weren't worthy of it. It was purely a gift of grace, and it won't be any different on that day either. It will be of grace because you won't be worthy of it then either, and neither will I. It will be unmerited blessing then, just as it was when we were first saved. It will be undeserved kindness, as it was the day we were first saved. We will no more deserve our home in heaven than we deserve our place in the church. We will no more deserve the eternal weight of glory than we deserve the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We will no more deserve the sinless perfection of body and soul forever than we deserve forgiveness of sin in this body and soul. We will no more deserve unhindered, unbroken, sweet, intimate communion with the living Lord than we deserve to be able to pray to Him today. It's grace. And it will always be grace. No man can save himself. No man can keep himself saved. And no man can earn his ultimate salvation glory. It is by grace that you have been saved. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. No one can boast. And just a little footnote here. Peter does use the present tense verb in verse 13. He says, set your hope fully on the grace that my translation in the ESV says, will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But it could read, since it is present tense, the grace that is being brought to you. In the Greek, sometimes when they wanted to say something in the future was so certain that you could set your mind on it. That it would surely come to pass. It is something in the future that will come just like you know the sun is going to rise in the morning. Then they would refer to it in the present tense, even though it is in the future. What a, do, do you think that way about your final hope? That it is so sure to you that it is as if it has already happened. As if it is happening right now. That's the idea here. That this grace is on the way already. Can you believe God for that? Can you set your hope fully on it? It is sure. It is done. That is such a good perspective to have. Just keep looking for grace. More grace and the fullness of grace when the Lord gives us the inheritance that He promised us and that He promised all the sons of us. So someone at this point should rightly ask, okay, I want, I want to set my hope fully on the grace that is to appear to me, that is coming to me at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to do this. How? Somebody should ask, how? How do I do that? How do I set my hope on this grace? I'm glad you asked. Peter did not leave you hanging. How do we live in light of this grace? Let's go back to the verse and find out. Now, we said that the main verb, the imperative verb, is fix your hope. But there are two Participles. And I know I'm getting into English territory here and lessons on that, and you might not understand it. That's okay. In English, you can usually see participles because they end in ing. And there's two of those here in verse 13. Participles in the Greek always modify the main verb. They're kind of like adverbs for us. Okay, they, they modify the main verb. So here, we're going to look at these participles that modify the main verb, and they come right at the beginning of verse 13. This is what it says. It says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and 
being sober-minded. That's how you fix your hope. They modify the main verb. The phrase in the ESV, preparing your minds for action, is one word. It's one word in the Greek. Preparing your minds for action. It, it, it has, it's a picture. It's a picture that is painted with words. And it means to gird up the loins of your mind. And you're, if you read in the King James, you may have that exact translation. Gird up the loins of your mind. Today, we don't do a lot of loin girding. Uh, and so we have to ask ourselves, well, what does that mean? Well, what does it mean to gird up your loins? Well, in that time, and you know it because you've seen movies and you know, you've understood what people dressed like in those days. They wore long, flowing robes. They, they wore these robes that reached down to below their knees. And that was fine when you were relaxing at home or at a dinner gathering or doing simple activities. But those robes would get in the way when it was time for some strenuous activity. When it was time to do some work. Men would pull up the bottoms of their robe and they would tuck them into their waist belt and kind of make themselves little shorts. They'd have shorts on then. They'd just take the robe and tuck it into their belt and ta-da, now you've got shorts and your robe is out of the way and you can get to work. You gird up your loins. That's the picture that we should see here. And today, we might say something like roll up your sleeves, right? That conveys the same kind of idea. With these, I don't want these getting get in the way. I don't want them to get filthy. I'm going to pull them up and get to work. I'm ready to go. We might say, roll up your sleeves. It means prepare for action. And he doesn't just say, gird up your loins. But he says, gird up the loins of your mind. Of your mind. Okay, so this is mental action. He says, don't be mentally lazy. Be fully engaged. This isn't the only figurative picture, though, that Peter uses. He also tells them to be sober-minded. This isn't simply referring to abstaining from alcohol. That's, that's part of it. The substance abuse can be one way of clouding the mind. But this phrase means more than that. It means to be self-controlled, to be alert. Our natural desires easily draw us into satisfying ourselves. And while not all of those desires are bad, they should never be in control of us. Amen. We should be in control of them. Amen. And so both of these expressions are active expressions. They're rolling up the sleeves of our mind and being fully self-controlled. This describes a life that isn't accidental. A life that doesn't just simply go with the flow. Amen. Instead, it's one that is intentional. Fully engaged in living for Christ. Also, notice that both of these commands are directed towards your mind. Often, we can't control the circumstances around us, right? I, I, can't, I tell my kids in school this all the time. I, you can't control what other people do or what situation you enter into. What you can control is you, your attitude, your actions. You can control you. And here... I think he's expressing that same kind of idea that but with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can't control the circumstances around us, but we can control our minds. Paul picks up on this when he exhorts the Corinthian readers to remember that they have the mind of Christ and commands them to take every thought captive, to make it obedient to Christ. Amen. That's the kind of intentional effort that Peter has in mind here. To control your mind. Don't let it wander. Don't let your thoughts and purposes and decisions just sort of hang loose and blow in the breeze like your flowing robe. But get it all tied down. Make a decisive life commitment to live in the reality of the grace that is to come. Paul said it this way in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. He said, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. That's direct. That's direct stuff. And church, I, I just don't think we live this way. I just don't think we live this way. We, we are so into this world that the thought of the coming of Christ is often distressing to us. In response to what God has given you in a great salvation, shouldn't you live in constant anticipation and hope for the grace that is to come? Have you forgotten how sweet His grace is? Have you forgotten... 
how sweet that grace is. Have you been a Christian so long that the grace of God has lost its sweetness to you? Be honest. Would the coming of Jesus Christ, if you knew it was going to happen tomorrow, be an intrusion into your life? Would it mess up your plans? We've become so worldly in our affection, so worldly in our interests, that I think if we're honest, we would kind of hope that Christ doesn't show up for a long time. Not necessarily because we have things to give up that are sinful. It's just we don't want to have our plans messed up. I mean, we got this big trip. We've been saving a long time for it. Man, I just got that boat that I've been looking for for a long time. I need to get out on the lake more. Or, I, I just got this motorcycle. I need to drive it more. Lord, don't, please don't come until after football season because i got season tickets, Lord. That's how we live life. I believe that most Christians living in our culture, or at least most people who claim to be Christians, would find that really thinking about the coming of Christ would be something that would be an intrusion to their plans. We just get so engulfed in the world. And so Peter says, will you disentangle your mind from that? Will you focus on the right thing? If you've lost the sense of overwhelming joy about how wonderful your salvation is, if fellowship with anyone here on this earth is more desirable to you than fellowship with Christ, if you would rather stay on earth than to be in God's glorious home in heaven, then you don't love His appearing. If you haven't girded up your mind, you haven't set your priorities, you haven't fixed your hope on the glorious grace that God has promised you, and it's probably because you've taken the grace that you've already experienced for granted. You've allowed yourself to become cold to its wonder. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't you think it grieves the heart of God when we would wish Him not to come just so we can fulfill our plans? Don't you think it grieves Him when we don't live in constant anticipation of His glorious presence? Since He has been so gracious to us and wants to pour out grace upon grace upon grace for us forever. We're more interested in the mundane, passing garbage of this world. Come to grips with where your heart is on this. Hope is the first imperative of the believer towards God. We're going to look at more next week. We're going to continue in this flow of thoughts from Peter. But I want you to leave here today considering your hope for a second week in a row. If you're a Christian, if you have been born again into a living hope that is all of grace, this is a salvation into which the prophets long to look, that even the angels watch as the drama of eternity. <clears throat> so is your hope broken today? Is your hope broken? Are you looking at the things of this world to satisfy you? Or is your aim to completely set the hope your hope on the grace of God and the glorious future kingdom that, await, that awaits us as joint heirs with Jesus. Is that you? Are you there? If you are on the outside looking in, if you're saying, I'm not there. I'm not that I, I, I would rather him wait a little while. I've got, I've got plans. I've got things I need to get done here. If you're on the other side and you feel like God is calling you into his family today, feel like, I don't want to be there. That's a sign that God's waking you up. If you no longer get enjoyment from the things of this world the way that you used to, you're new. You've been created in Him new. You've got new desires, new attitudes, new feelings. And so, where does that go? What do we do with that? Well, I would love to talk to you more. We'd love to talk to you more about how that hope can be yours in Christ. And I'd love for this to be your home away from our eternal home in heaven. We are exiles in a strange land, but our church is meant to be like a little embassy. It's like a little embassy in that foreign land where we can gather together and we can talk about our king. We can talk about our kingdom. We can rejoice and we can be ambassadors and go out to the tadpoles. We can go out to those around us. And to invite them in. Invite them in. And to, to rejoice in our kingdom. 
rejoice in our King. So we as a church want to partner with you. We want to partner with you to keep your focus right and to work along with you in the work of the gospel together. So if you don't have church home or if you consider this home but have never made it official, then talk with us about how to join us here every day. Let's pray. Father God, we, we rejoice in our salvation. God, you're, you are so gracious to us in the midst of our death and our sin and our despicableness. You came Christ. You sent Christ to die in my place for my sins. So that if I would simply trust in Him, if I would simply place my hope and my life in Him and Him alone, and I become new. <laughs> You've made us new creatures in Christ, and we rejoice in so great a salvation. And God, help us to fix our hope not on the things of this world, but on the things to come, on the things of heaven, on the grace that is to be revealed to us on that final day, just as it was on the first day of our salvation. God, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we ask that you would transform us, make us new yet again. Continue to reform us from one degree of glory to the next so that you might be reflected in us. That we don't have any glory of our own, but we are we're like the moon. We reflect your glory, oh God. You as the sun. We point others to you. Help us to do that in our daily lives. Help us to cast aside all of the cares that so easily entangle us, the sins that trip us up and to gird up our loins. Prepare ourselves for action. Amen. That we might be about the, the great commission and the great commandment to love you and love others. In Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen.